So welcome to this final session and uh, we hope some more colleagues will be joining us. I'm being sort of hyper punctual because we shortened the coffee break a little bit, uh, but uh, we'll have more people coming in. This is our final session now here at uh, the World Health Summit. It's uh, a session on the SDG3 Global Action Plan for Health and Wellbeing. Some of you that were here last year might remember that together with Dr. Tedros, we had one of the first public introductions to the Global Action Plan. At that point, it was still a kind of uh, conceptual, strategic thing. Meanwhile, the uh, 12 organizations have worked together to uh, develop a real plan. And it's that plan we want to talk about. It was also launched at the UN General Assembly this year in the presence of uh, the initiators, Chancellor Merkel, the Prime Minister of Norway, and the President of Ghana. And of course, you can access the action plan uh, on uh, the various uh, websites. How we will approach this session is that we will first show you a short video on the action plan. And the important thing about this video is that it gives a voice to each of the principles of the 12 organizations. We couldn't very well, you know, put all 12 of them up here. And uh, therefore, uh, I'd like to ask our, our technical people to show you this video, and then I will introduce the panelists, and they will come up here on stage. So please, the video on the global action plan. There are those who say it can't be done. It's impossible. But we have shown that when we come together, anything is possible. With just 10 years to achieve the sustainable development goals, business as usual will not work. Around the world, leaders are seeking ways to accelerate progress towards health and well-being for all. The Global Action Plan for Healthy Lives and Well-Being for All is a joint commitment by 12 agencies to better support countries accelerate progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. We will engage with countries to identify priorities and plan and implement together. We will also accelerate progress through joint action in seven areas, including primary health care. We will align our operations, policies, and resources to streamline our support to countries. And we will account for our actions by reviewing progress and learning together. Maximizing our efforts to achieve SDG 3. That is what the Global Action Plan is all about. This is an all-hands-on-deck moment. The Global Action Plan will help to deepen the culture of collaboration across agencies and help us to provide more integrated support to countries on health. By working together and holding ourselves accountable, we will be able to help save more lives and to accelerate progress for health for all. Ultimately, it's countries and communities that will deliver health and well-being for all. Our role is to support them. With meaningful engagement of communities, we can achieve better health for more people more quickly. The Global Action Plan aims to translate uh, collaboration at the global level to tangible progress at the country level to achieve results and scale up our investments. The Global Action Plan will help UNICEF make the most of these resources for community health services, integrated health and nutrition programs, and quality care. We have to build out the health system, particularly the primary health system, to the last mile. And to do that, we need to have everybody working together. We want to see more women and girls with decision-making power over their bodies, their health, and their futures. And to make this a reality, we need this collaboration. Working together, we inspire each other. We spark new ideas. We align our efforts. The Global Action Plan offers a structured way for each organization to contribute its expertise to a common cause. When we work together, put aside our egos, put aside our silos, we're more efficient, more effective for the common good of every single child on the planet. Do we think we can make a real difference in people's health and lives? Yes. We have developed the plan, now it's time for action. Stronger collaboration, 
we mean better help. Stronger, stronger, stronger collaboration. 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 Stronger collaboration. Stronger collaboration. Better help. Better help. Now there you saw a bunch of really motivated people and principals uh, committing themselves to work together and they have of course all not only spoken in the video but signed the action plan, have committed themselves to implementing it and you heard very clearly we are there to support countries. This is not an engagement that, you know, 12 agencies meet together in some rooms regularly. It's really to be there to support countries. And that is what we will be doing here with some of the principals and some representatives from countries. So could I please ask the speakers to come up? We have uh, Dr. Bernhard Schwartländer from the WHO, the chef de cabinet. We have Peter Sands, who is the uh, director of the Global Fund. We have Seth Berkeley, who is the CEO of uh, Gavi. We have the ministers, Jane Ruth Aseng, uh, to join us. And uh, we have Magda Robalo. Uh, from uh, Guinea-Bissau. Jane, of course, is uh, from uh, Uganda. We have, and we have one of the partners of the Action Plan, Jeremy Farrar, from the Wellcome Trust. Those of you that are familiar with the seven accelerators will know that one of them is on research and innovation, and it's absolutely critical to have key partners from that field also involved and supportive. So uh, it's my pleasure to first ask Bernhard to say a couple of words about, you know, what is this thing about? And particularly also, what is the role of WHO in that context? I think you prefer to stand when you speak, so please do that for the introduction. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ilona, the queen of global health. And uh, of course, a big, big thank you for the two ministers that uh, join us here today. And I want to start with them because, I mean, as Dr. Tetos just said, as the director of the World Health Organization, that we are guests in your countries and we're here to do whatever we can to help, to engage, to accelerate. And I think Minister from Guinea-Bissau just said, uh, we want more health for the money. That is why we are here. And I will very give, briefly give you a, a, a sort of a summary of where we came from with the Global Action Plan. But then I want to leave all the time, uh, not only to our ministers to tell us exactly what you need, but also to our partners from the other agencies, uh, Peter and Seth, and of course, Jeremy Farrar, who is a partner in, in driving one of the accelerators. Uh, so we can talk about the debate that um, how we really make that happen, how do we really get more health for the money. Now, it is actually a historic moment. Um, exactly one year ago, we were in this room, in this very room, when we launched basically the first phase of the Global Action Plan. It was then announced uh, together with Bill Gates and others and Chancellor Merkel, of course, who was one of the um, signatories of the original letter, uh, together with uh, Prime Minister Solheim and the President of Ghana, who had sent us a letter in April last year requesting us as the organization, international organizations, health organizations, uh, to work to, together more closely in support of uh, the country programs, our country partners. And that, of course, wasn't the first time that such a request was made, but collectively we felt this is really the right time to do that. This is not a plan, it's not business as usual, they just won't cut it. It is a commitment uh, to, uh, to joint action, it's a commitment to delivering results. And within a very short period of time, and I think this is really remarkable, and it's historic, it was historically remarkable, the first time ever that all of the heads of the agencies personally signed this commitment and committed to work together for the coming year, and we are here today uh, just a couple of weeks after we presented the full plan um, again, and you saw the short video which was played in New York at the General Assembly where the full plan was presented. Now, this is where we came from. Um, now, what really counts is where do we move? 
and how do we go from here and translate these commitments um, to accelerate to work more effectively together in results in impact at the country level. I think this is the focus. Now, the role of the World Health Organization, one more reason why I don't want to spend too much time here, we don't own this plan. We see ourselves as conductors, as partners, as friends with our colleagues to, that we pull together. And I think it's remarkable how over the last year, uh, we had weekly calls where we committed to really work through the issues, you know, not only uh, the wording in the text, but how we actually go about um, implementing together, finding the synergies, understanding better to start with what our country partners need, and coming behind that uh, collectively. Um, so I think with that I want to stop here, uh, because all of the points should come out of a discussion from those who are really involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernhard. Thank you, Bernhard. And as it should be, and as we've heard from Dr. Tedros and from others, uh, this is about the countries, and therefore we will start our discussion with the countries. We want to hear from the ministers. And uh, I'd like to ask Her Excellency, the Minister of Health of Uganda, first, when you heard about this action plan, you know, what went through your head? Now that uh, it's there, how do you think it can help you? should work. Try. Yes. <laughs> this is a forceful minister. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much, Ilona. I just didn't hear about the action plan. I was here when it was launched and we discussed it. I participated. And uh, I was excited because 12 agencies coming together to say they need to strengthen their collaboration to support the countries to accelerate progress towards the Sustainable Development Goal targets is a good thing. It is a good thing because then we can work in a more streamlined manner without duplications, but also track our actions and be able to give accountability for our actions. It is true that the 12 agencies have been supporting us, all of them, very good support. But they need to come together. They need to speak as one. They need to know what each other is doing if they are to support us better. But we as countries, we also need to be prepared to work with them to give accountability and also to put the money where it will have greater impact. So it is exciting. And uh, <clears throat> I must say that it is not that they're just going to start. They've already been working with us. But it is good to hear progress since the time when it was launched. And maybe I'll talk about that a little later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. So let's hear from our, our second minister, Dr. Carrere Silva. Uh, you know, you also worked in WHO at one stage, and now you're a minister. Now, you know, you have also expectations towards this action plan, but you've been part of a presence in the countries before. So how does it resonate with you, this idea of an action plan? Did you say, well, finally, they're getting their act together? Or, you know, how is it that you see it? Thank you, um, Ilona. You know, it is um, a completely different scenario when you are sitting on the other side of the table. And I'm experiencing now uh, some of the things I used to tell countries that you should do this, you should do that. Uh, maybe you should do this way, try that one. So it is now different uh, to be on this side of the table. But to start, um, um, there is one point I want to, to, to make. I think um, under the um, mantra of leaving no one behind, I think it is important to leave no country behind. And I think partners, the 12 agencies uh, on this uh, global action plan should have that perspective. I come from a country uh, which is fragile, vulnerable, small, very small population. And I think 
um, when I look at the way partners operate at a global level, and again, going back to my perspectives from WHO, countries like mine are normally left behind. And I think if we are going to implement this global action plan, we also need to pay attention to small populations, small countries, but with great needs. And coming to the country level, I think the leadership of the government is key. Um, the government should be able to make everyone sit around the table, identify the needs, the gaps, and be able to, in a complementary manner, uh, see which agency will best provide which type of resources. In countries like mine, you'll find uh, one agency playing a role for actually uh, covering for many others. Uh, and that's um, uh, a challenge that we have, very few um, uh, technical resources, very limited financial resources. So I think a platform like the Global Action Plan is absolutely fantastic to help us manage the little that we have, but we expect uh, that there will be uh, more attention for uh, fragile uh, countries like, uh, like Guinea-Bissau so that we, we definitely leave no one behind. Thank you very much, and you will notice that quite consciously, you know, we have a very large country, we have a very small country, and uh, the action plan is relevant to all of them, if in slightly different ways. If I can just come back to the uh, two of you with asking you for a, a quick response, Ruth, how would you define success of the action plan in your country? Again, thank you for that uh, great question. Success, I would define it by the impact of our actions on the population and the fundamental change in the health indices in our countries. How do we achieve that? We need resources. We need better strategies. We need more collaboration, more partnerships, including accountability. So if at the end of the next 10 years, Uganda is a healthier country, then I will say the action plan has achieved its aim. And I do hope that will come to pass. Thank you. Magda? The um, improvement on the indicators will be uh, a great measure of success, but that will take time to, to, to be measured. And um, in the short term, I think if we are able to have one common plan where everyone agrees what needs to be done by whom and when and how much it's going to cost, if we map our resource gaps and then see that the, the gap is smaller meaning that everyone is actually doing its bit, then already in the short term we know uh, that there is uh, convergence and working together. In the medium term, I think uh, we need to be paying attention to outcomes, uh, and I think uh, measuring results and metrics are going to be important as well. Uh, we need to, around the action plan that countries will, will have, we need to identify what are the measurements, we are going to use very little, very small, we don't need many, because we also need to make sure that this working together by 12 agencies will not mean more meetings, more workshops, and more planning, uh, so that we don't actually have time for implementation. Uh, but metrics are going to be important to um, let us know in the short, medium to long term, whether we are doing the right things and then improving the lives of people. Thank you very much. I'd like to come to uh, some of the principles now because, so here is the action plan. I was privileged to be uh, able to sit in on some of the meetings as it was produced. There were highly motivated, hardworking Sherpas taking the agenda forward, partly fighting over every approach and every word. But of course, the issue is to accelerate. And also as one accelerates, there are 
you have a plan, but you sort of also need to change within an organization. I guess you need to change mind frames. You need to uh, be able to uh, give a message throughout the organization that every single staff member also needs to contribute to the success of the action plan, both at uh, the general office level and at the country level. Seth, how do you see that for Gavi? Is there anything Gavi now needs to do differently, or would you say, oh, we've actually always done this? These are on. You don't need to do anything. If you do something, you probably turn it off. Okay. I turned it on. Good. Miracle. <laughs> So we don't have um, uh, staff at the field level, and that's an important difference. Yeah. A number of the partners do, a number of us don't. But, but let me answer your question, and, and to say, first of all, Gavi is an alliance by definition. So we are already working as partners, and of course, um, uh, WHO, UNICEF, the World Bank are our core partners, but we have 54 other partners we're working with. So what's changed over time? Well, part of it is a recognition that some of the things we want to do can't be done, not only by us, but even by that subset of partners. And an example, traditionally, the Global Fund was not a very strong partner of Gavi, but we realized that there's a great opportunity as two financing organizations to come together, and where do we come together? We still have separate missions, we still have separate ways of working, but it's purposeful collaboration. So we begin the process of asking at every level in our organizations, where does it make sense to work together? Where does it not make sense to work together? And so areas like in health system strengthening, areas like in trying to digitalize health records and creating better health information systems in improving supply chains, it makes sense to work together. And that is something that Peter and I have tried to do. When I look at the overall 12 agencies, I doubt, and I want to put this out on the table, that we will work with all 12 of them or even work with them equally. What we will do is reach out and try to figure out where are there places that we can make synergies and where can we not. So that's an important part of the philosophy behind it. But, you know, you ask what we will do differently. We're pivoting now. We've been very successful. We started, our role was to bring new vaccines to countries. We've done 430 vaccine launches. We're very good at that. But vaccines don't deliver themselves. Coverage rates have gone up 21%. Immunization is the most widely distributed health intervention. The people who don't get it, about 10% aren't in the routine system, they don't get any health intervention. So we'd like to pivot to a world of equity, we'd like to pivot to a last mile first and come up with metrics on how to identify zero-dose children, zero-dose communities. Now, where does this plan really connect to that? Well, one of the challenges is going to be health workers. This is not something that Gavi can solve by itself. In fact, it's not something even that the 12 agencies, because we're going to have to worry about whether the IMF has restrictions on, on staffing in countries and on what civil service does and other activities. So the, this is bigger than us, and how do we collaborate together to solve those problems? On innovative, we'll come back, I'm sure, to talk about the accelerators, but on domestic financing, we have our own requirements for co-financing, but at the end, we want more money for health. How do we together come together and, and advocate for that and work together and not take money from each other? So these are the types of, of, of working partnerships that we have to have. We're doing it under the leadership of WHO, but the last thing I'd say is that the really difficult part of this is not where we collaborate. It's when countries say, we have a need, and nobody is filling that need. And then the tough issue is going to be, how do we adapt, and, and, and we of the different agencies, or frankly other agencies, to be able to help countries? Because as Peter said in an earlier session, it's all about being at the country level, and what we need to do is respond to their needs, and, and that's really, I think, where the challenge is going to be going forward. Thank you. Peter, could you pick up from there and how you see those questions for the Global Fund? Well, I, I would start by agreeing pretty well with everything that um, Seth said. Like Gavi, the Global Fund is a partnership model. We don't have resources on the ground. So to get anything done, 
we have to work with the countries, we have to work with civil society, we have to work with the other agencies, with the WRs from WHO um, and so on. Um, but I think what the Global Action Plan has done has, is in a sense given us a, a self-administered collective kick into saying it's really important to make, to leverage all the synergies, to simplify, to coordinate, not overcomplicate by doing things differently. And, and there's a lot of very practical things going on. I mean, the test will be, do we do practical things that end up, as both the ministers said, actually making a difference to the lives of the people in the communities? Um, but to give just two examples of something that's just happened and something that's about to happen, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, we signed a framework agreement with the World Bank and GFF around how we do blended finance transactions. Now, have we done blended finance transactions with the World Bank before? Yes, we have. But every time we've done one, it's been kind of handcrafted. And all the sort of things have been done as if it was done but for the first time. So now we've um, um, ag agreed this is the basis on which we will share reporting, audit data, all this kind of stuff. So it'll be much, much simpler um, to do these transactions in the future. And when you think about the sustainability um, challenges, the whole transition towards UHC and things, being able to do those kind of blended finance transactions is really important. That's a very recent example. If I l look forward, um, we've just come out of our replenishment and that means we're gonna enter very quickly into um, the next grant cycle. And so we'll be deploying the best part of $14 billion over the next three years um, in um, a whole range of different countries. And what's really critical is that that money is used in ways that is integrated into the National Strategic Plans for Health. And there's a whole sort of process by which that happens. And I think it'll be an interesting test of the Global Action Plan is if we can effectively engage all the partners so that we both get their input but also leverage their capabilities in a way that integrates the various um, efforts. And so that, and that process will unfold during the course of um, 2020. And we, are, um, and we are very keen for that to happen. I mean, we're, we absolutely want to get other partners because if you think about some of the critical challenges, um, for example, uh, if we want to beat HIV, one of the things we have to do is massively reduce infection rates among adolescent girls and young women. We will not beat the epidemic if we don't reduce infection rates among adolescent girls and young women who are two to six times as vulnerable as young men of the same age. Now that's not something the Global Fund can do alone. Um, it's, and it's something that actually not even health ministries can do alone, because typically it requires the education ministry involved, and you can see UNFPA, you can see UN Women, of course the expertise from WHO, UNICEF is involved in some places, and we want to sort of bring together that um, constellation of actors supporting countries in delivering national plans, because the reality is at the moment on that particular issue, we're doing some good stuff, we're not on top of the problem. We're not reducing infection rates um, fast enough. So to my mind, the kind of thing that, to your question of what constitutes success, um, if we haven't massively reduced infection rates among adolescent girls and young women over the next few years, then we will have failed. And it'll be a collective failure um, of all of us of not using and leveraging the various capabilities and partnerships that we could do to make that happen. And that's just one, you know, obviously there are other examples in other diseases and things, but that would be one very tangible example where partnership is critical to making this happen. Thank you, and you've said two very important things, uh, Peter. On the one hand, I think you've illustrated very clearly what acceleration means. You know, it's not just a slogan. You, you won't, one can really uh, understand it tangibly from your example. And you've also said very, something very important, and you've said collective failure. Because in the past, there would usually be finger pointing, you know, to say they didn't do their job, they didn't do their job, they didn't do their job. 
But I think this understanding of we now have this global action plan, and if we work properly together with countries, then uh, uh, then you know that will be a joint success. In some cases, even close to you know helping achieve a global good. But if we don't do it, it will be a collective failure. So, uh, Bernhard, how, how would you see this? Because I think, you know, aside from uh, being a, a sort of uh, director, coordinator, whatever, one's very careful with the words, uh, given, you know, such strong and independent partners as it should be. But also, WHO is in a way pivotal because it has these country offices. And frequently, when one discusses WHO, people say this is still one of the weak points of WHO, that not all country offices should be as, are as strong as they should be. But I think with this action plan in mind, that's really where the excellence needs to be to support everything else around the action plan and for the countries. How would you respond to that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that really is at the core also of the transformation of our own organization. Uh, this is not only how we work between organizations, but it's also how we work as individual organizations and how we transform this. But let me start with, uh, I want to go back to, to the, the, our colleague, the minister. I, I, it would really warm my heart, if I may say, so you started to say, if we are implementing together, we will be successful. And that the V coming from a minister is exactly what we need. I mean, it's basically, we are partners in this and we need to live up to that. And that's clearly also where we, as WHO, we see our role as leveraging the space for health. You're not here as, you know, just to, to look into, you know, a clinic, a pill or whatever. I mean, these are all inputs into achieving impact, as Minister from Uganda said. That's what ultimately counts. We have to pull it, we have to pull the whole package together. And this is where we need the partners. Now, your question, of course, was very well chosen. <laughs> it's, are we ready to really do this? As much as we have been, I think, hopefully somewhat successful creating this space globally, bringing our friends and partners along um, to, to, to really commit and, and, and work together on this as, as in, in a partnership, we will have to do the same thing at the country level. We have to be the partners at the country level that pull everybody in. And it, of course, it has to start with the 12 agencies that have committed you know, through their principles, through their, the whole teams that have worked together. Um, but it also has to be all the others at the country level who can contribute. It is the NGOs, it is engagement with civil society, which is not traditionally a very strong area uh, for the World Health Organization. So we have to rethink, we have to find ways of engaging with the private sector um, that are, you know, many very much involved in delivery of health uh, in, in, in many ways. So, so we have to really uh, find new ways of working and thinking and we will have to do a very deliberate effort of um, making sure that our uh, country officers, our country reps are fully empowered. They have the skills, the way we select them, the way we train them, the way we give them tools, and the way we give them incentives, strategic resources. And we have, for the first time, put a very significant part of our budget aside that will start in January 2020, um, solely for the purpose to give our country reps flexible resources to be able to very quickly react to a request from the minister and being able to pull together our partners, you know, create the platform to have these discussions and to reach these agreements, bring in the right consultants, um, and, and then, of course, the whole machinery can follow and, and uh, you know, bring, bring uh, more capacity to that. But that we can react quickly, the acceleration, that we can react, you know, in, in a, in a, we can act in a way um, that brings the right partners together. Um, all of these things we have to, we have to focus on, um, but we, we have started um, not only to work with our partners, but to work also internally to redesign uh, how we act actually also at the country level. Thank you, Magda. Can I just jump to you for a minute because you've had the two identities in a way. If you listen to Bernhard and sort of put on your old WHO country rep hat and at the same time, you know, reflect as a minister, does that uh, resound with you or, you know, would you have some advice to him uh, in terms of, you know, what should WHO be doing in terms of its country offices to get this action plan really 
on the road to help the other partners through uh, their country representation? Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I think um, the reforms that the WHO started uh, in order to be able to meet the, the challenges of uh, the 21st century and becoming a more agile organization um, have um, started to uh, providing, uh, to showing results. Uh, but I think uh, we still need much more, not just the WHO, but every other agency, including the ministers of health. We need to leave our comfort zones. Um, and I think what we need to be doing is, um, WHO, for example, should the, the, the rep and the, even the technical staff should be able to give political, technical, strategic, and all-round support in order for the ministries, the government, to be able to leverage resources uh, internally, externally, technical, political, human, and any other resources that are needed. So it takes a different kind of courage, a different kind of ambition and will to do things, uh, which, um, uh, we have been talking about it is not going to be business as usual, but I don't think our mindset has shifted to business as usual. I think um, the political economy of getting the health business in the countries is going to be tougher and tougher uh, as we go on. I was just um, talking about um, the slowing down of economic growth in some of our countries. And we need to factor that into how we are going to achieve the goals, the ambitious goals that we have, with less money, more needs for education, gender equality. Every other SDG is going to require more resources. So how, in the health sector, are we going to fight for more resources? Are we going to uh, maximize the resources that we have, reduce efficiencies, live in the comfort zone, starting from Geneva, New York, and then getting down to the countries is going to be critical. Finally, we also know that uh, it takes uh, ages to translate global agreements into country results. Uh, and that's something we need to be paying attention to. Uh, we can talk nicely in Berlin. When I go back to Bissau, it's business as usual and uh, guidance is not yet translated down uh, so that uh, we can do business differently. Uh, I think um, I encourage WHO to continue with the reforms and accelerate, but every other uh, partner in the, in the global action plan to also do the same. We spoke about private sector, we spoke about civil society. They need to get on board so that we can multiply the effects of these good ideas that we have. Thank you very much. Seth, you wanted to add something after having heard Peter? Yeah, I, well, after hearing everybody, because the other group we haven't talked about is other bilaterals. And I want to make that point that's important because this is about bringing together a group to try to work for purposeful collaboration. But if we are successful, we, as we are successful in working with countries, if the bilaterals are operating completely outside of this and, and doing something different, that's not gonna help us. So I think one of the really important things, not to complicate, I'm not saying that every bilateral needs to sign the plan up, but particularly the countries that have pushed this and have been engaged with this may want to begin to think about how they align behind some of these uh, ways of supporting countries. Because again, if some of these big changes that need to be made, which are expensive and difficult, are going to require everybody pulling in the same direction, not just the 12 agencies. Thank you. Ruth, uh, if you hear all this, you know, here's 12 in the Global Action Plan, and then at country level, uh, civil society, private sector, possibly other, um, other ministries, last not least because some of the partners also relate to other ministries. If you take uh, UNICEF or UN Women, uh, just as an example, or the World Food Programme, if that be it, even UNDP with its overarching responsibilities. So uh, how would you, uh, if you look at Uganda and you say, you know, we really want to use this action plan as uh, a tangible instrument to accelerate for health and the kind of outcomes you've said. Um, how do you think one should be going about it? Now, the important thing is that uh, 
the 12 agencies committed to four goals. And one of them was to engage with the countries, which is extremely important. Not that they've not been engaging, they have been engaging, but they have different ways of doing their things. And most of them rely on the country plans. They committed to enhance accountability, to support countries to enhance their accountability, not the agencies. They also committed to accelerating progress and then to align um, support of the countries by harmonizing operational and financial strategies, which is good. What I would expect of them is to come together, of course, under the coordination of the World Health Organization, and begin to understand the different countries, how they operate, how much resources they are channeling there, because they are channeling thousands and billions of uh, dollars to the different countries. There are certain specific agencies that do vertical programs that also signed onto the action plan. Not Gavi, not Global Fund, but they are there. They also need to bring on board what they are doing because the bottom line is first eliminate duplication, streamline the issues so that Gavi knows what Global Fund is doing and Global Fund knows what Gavi is doing and they know what the resources are doing, similar to the UN women and the various agencies that are there. In that way, it will enable our countries also to understand how much money is actually coming into the countries. Because there are, there are certain agencies that we don't know how much money they bring. Some of them, like UNHCR, goes directly to the refugees. I want to have that aligned onto my plan. So that at the end of the day, when we sit down and look at the agencies, how much money in total in a year did they bring to Uganda? What did this money do? And what has it translated into? Then we can come together with the 12 agencies and have a discussion on a table like this with the Minister of Health Uganda and the Minister of Finance and so on and say, why did you not achieve the targets? We gave you the money, we have supported you in all these areas. And then we can also give our accountability. So the most important thing is strengthening the collaboration, but let's add on to the table transparency. Magda, would you want to add to that? I'm sure. Yes. Um, before I add to that, there was an issue uh, raised by, uh, I think, uh, Seth, uh, about bilaterals. And um, I, I wanted to add the comments on the importance then of multilateralism. We know that um, bilateralism, unilateralism, and multilateralism can play important uh, uh, roles in um, joint uh, or common um, uh, activities such as this one. And that's where I think, uh, again, uh, the political economy uh, is important for us to be able to leverage to the maximum uh, all the opportunities that are available. Talking about transparency and knowing actually how much money comes to the country, how, many, how much resources are channeled to the country, and how much of those resources are indeed managed by the country. That's a major challenge. Um, people, uh, agencies, organizations tend to retrench and move back if you ask for more accountability. But they actually ask for accountability from governments. So it has to be mutual accountability. Uh, as much as I want my ministry to be able to account for every cent that we receive, I also want to know what every cent that comes to my country is going to achieve. 
uh, for the betterment of the health uh, and the lives of the people. This is a very sensitive area and um, there are trade-offs and difficult conversations uh, which uh, sometimes you have to have. Uh, the issue of leadership, uh, we uh, are told uh, being the driver's seat, uh, country at the center, exercise leadership. And sometimes when you want to exercise leadership, you realize that uh, you put people in a very uncomfortable zones. So these are conversations we need to have. And I think uh, transparency and accountability and um, mutual respect and uh, trust is going to be important. Thank you, Magda. I'd like to come back to this uh, uh, notion of uh, accountability and you know, having a new transformative kind of conversation between the different actors involved. But first I want to pull in uh, uh, Jeremy Farrar, uh, the Executive Director of the Wellcome Trust, into this conversation. Jeremy, you've, you've been involved, you've been involved with the accelerator around you know, research and, and development. Uh, you've hosted a workshop on these issues here at, at the World Health Summit. Uh, looked at you know, from a, uh, as a supportive uh, partner in a way. Uh, can you share some of your thoughts around the experience of being involved in the formulation of this action plan and uh, where you see it should be going? Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Um, it's been great to, to listen to the, to the comments. Um, I, I'd just like to start by, by paying tribute to the 12 agencies. Um, you know, it's a, it's a relatively cynical world at the moment. Um, and for those 12 agencies to have come together and at the moment to have put aside whatever differences there were before and to said we'll commit to working together and to say that publicly, I, th I think that is just a moment you need to stop and celebrate because that wouldn't have been possible five years ago probably. Um, and yet it has happened. Now, how that pans hey, out... Hey, clap for them. How that... How that pans out over the next decade, I think, is yet to be... Um, we don't know yet. Um, and, and that video that was shown at the start should be kept for everybody and repeated at every World Health Summit so that everybody is held accountable for what, for what was said. Um, but the 12 agencies do deserve great credit. And, and, and again, just whilst they're on the stage, I think we also ne need to give great credit uh, to the Global Fund and Gavi. I mean, can you imagine a world when those didn't exist now? And, and the replenishment, I think, has been absolutely amazing. And the two agencies have worked together to not compete for those resources, but to be mutually supportive. And I think that's going to be crucial going into the replenishment of Gavi uh, next, next year. But I, I come from a, um, a research agency, and, and I'd, I'd also say that the research, research agencies around the world uh, come together in the heads of international research organizations, about 40 or 50 national agencies from around the world and some philanthropists, could learn a lot from these 12 agencies. And actually at the next meeting, which is in Delhi, I'll bring this up about how those research bodies could learn lessons from the 12 agencies coming together to come together in a better way to work together to support the work that you're doing and I'll take that uh, to the Delhi um, Heroes meeting. But just a, a comment on the next decade. Um, we are going to face the challenges we know about, climate change, drug resistance, the non-communicable diseases, the demographic shift. But just a comment that I think the minister made, which was so important. There will be headwinds that we do not yet know about. Uh, there will be geopolitical changes coming up in the next 10 years that we can't yet predict. Uh, science will offer new opportunities and bringing together scientific advancement with innovation and making sure those two things fit in to the societies in which they are part of will be absolutely critical to addressing A, today's challenges, but the challenges we do not yet know about. And so I believe that science has an absolutely critical role to play in this and the accelerator that we've been part of in helping to, sh to shift forward absolutely, I think, must remain integral into the next uh, decade of development. The country priorities, if, if there's one message I think that goes away from, from this panel, it is that the country priorities have to take preference. I was lucky enough uh, to work for 18 years in Vietnam. One of the things I learned about Vietnam, maybe because of its history and it's not unique in this, but it owned its priorities. And it was very clear for 18 years working in Vietnam who was in charge. 
recently working with Uganda, Rwanda, and the DRC on the Ebola outbreak, it's very clear in the last few months in particular who's in charge. And that is such a change, that's such a difference, and it actually it makes it mutually um, much easier to work together when, when that is true. And the final thing I'd say, uh, Ilona, is this is a grand vision. I love the way you're now calling it an action plan rather than getting lost in the word global because action is at the heart of it and I think we should put that as the uh, signature of this, uh, this push. Um, but we've got to, we're going to have to prioritize. Um, there, is, there are not enough resources to do everything everybody would wish to do and that is going to require some hard choices and that is going to mean some people will be pleased and some people will be disappointed but we're going to have to face up to those sorts of choices. Thank you very much, Jeremy. So let's uh, do two things. First of all, let's uh, hear uh, from the three agencies around this issue of accountability and transparency that was raised. What are your experiences now? Where do you think it can be uh, improved? How can the action plan help and contribute? Please, Seth, if you would start, and then Peter, please. So. So I think one of the important things that certainly Gavi and the Global Fund have tried to do is be transparent about the resources. You can go on our website and know exactly to the penny how much money countries have gotten. But there's another part of this that's much more complicated that we started doing over the last few years. And that is asking countries to evaluate the technical assistance they're getting and to give them the full costing on that technical assistance and have them make those decisions. Now, I have no doubt that this is the right thing to do. It is a painful and difficult thing because, as, as Bernard said, we, you know, WHO wants to get the quality of people, the office quality up. It's an awful complicated thing to say to a country, you've now got to rate and decide whether the agencies that have offices in your country and have staffs in country are meeting your needs. And, and the reason that's so important, and it's a little bit building on what Jeremy said, is the problems are getting more difficult, they're more complex, they cut across different agencies, and it may not be the expertise we have. And so one of the reasons we have 54 partners at Gavi is because sometimes the best technical expertise comes from WHO, but sometimes it comes from an accounting agency in building financing systems. Or if somebody needs advice on taxes, maybe that comes from you know, the IMF. And so what we need to do, and this is, you know, is to provide the full range of assistance for um, countries and make that transparent and put them in the driver's seat. And they have to feel comfortable doing that. Sometimes they're not, and I understand that, but this is going to be important as we go forward, and I hope this can become part of the broader conversation because, you know, we hear a lot of complaints behind the scenes, but we need to turn those into action as well. Yeah, and that would really be part of the transformation that the SDGs actually ask us to do. Peter, please. I think what's coming out of this conversation is the fact that at one level, the Global Action Plan is a set of commitments to sort of fairly tangible actions, and we can sort of see how we're doing against this. But at another level, basically, it's trying to change a set of mindsets and norms about the way development partners are going to work with countries. And the, the latter is as important as the former. Um, because um, we, can, we can tick off a bunch of deliverables, um, but what we actually want to do is change the nature of the dialogue and do it also in a way that is inclusive, that draws in the bilateral partners and so on, because if we only do it as the multilaterals, we'll be missing a big, pit, big bit of the picture. And your desire to have the total picture of what's going on in Uganda won't be delivered, um, because like Gavi, I mean, we're, we are totally transparent in, in terms of how much money we put into a country um, and what it's being spent on. Um, but I also think we should raise the bar on all of us about the accountability issue and um, the transparency issue. So, for example, we um, negotiate with countries co-financing um, obligations. Um, and countries vary in their let's say, commitment to the transparency of, of those. And one of the things we're looking at 
is, okay, we think those should be more transparent because in the same way that um, civil society holds us to account, um, civil society should be able to hold um, national governments to account for the commitments they're making um, alongside us. Um, in general, I think that we need to um, make sure in the way we think about the mechanics of the Global Action Plan that we, we keep it open all the time. We keep it open to bilaterals, we keep it open to civil society, we keep it open to the private sector. Many of the 12 agencies um, aren't quite as accustomed to working with the private sector or the civil society as either Gavi or the Global Fund. So the, the very, very varying levels of comfort um, with doing that. Um, but I think we absolutely need to push on that because ultimately we need governments leading an all of society movement and journey um, to deliver SDG3. It's not just going to be sort of governments talking to multilateral agencies that, that will get us there. Bernhard? I think um, accountability is over the core of success. I mean, otherwise, it, it, we, we run the risk that it's one more sort of plan, right? I mean, that, that's what you all say. The, the, the things that have been said is that the accountability has to be uh, towards impact. Um, you know, the ministers have very clearly said this. I mean, what measures ultimately, what the measure of success ultimately is, is better health of people. And we need to be very clear that we um, define better indicators that allow us to measure are we actually well on track with that and eventually also can, can, can say in 10 years time, yes, we have really collectively and together achieved much better health for people. The World Health Organization has a completely new strategy, a completely new approach to, to organizing our own work, which is a three billion, but it's not only for WHO as an organization, it's actually for health, I would say. I think it was a very broad commitment of all of the member states behind this of all the partners coming in, and that's uh, you know, one billion people having better access to universal you know, coverage, one billion people being safer, and one billion people having healthier lives. Those, these are clear numbers that we need to uh, live towards too. Now, as, as others have said, it takes time to get there, and we can't just sit there and say, well, okay, let's look at this in 10 years, how, how, how far have we come? So we have to hold ourselves accountable every month uh, every week, in a sense, but every month, every year. Um, and, and one of the things that, that uh, sort of came to my mind is that uh, we should also, in the spirit of real transparency, have something of a 360 satisfaction survey, where we really come together in all honesty and uh, you know, talk or put down on paper, have you been satisfied by ourselves, so, you know, you know, also, also in the partnership by the partners that we work with, in delivering um, what we have done. And if that's a real honest and transparent dialogue, it will show um, you know, the places where we've done well and it will show the places where there are frustrations. And that's important because that's the frustrations we have to overcome uh, collectively. Um, so I, I think there also needs to be innovation in how we measure accountability. I mean, not only innovation, how we deliver, and, and a lot of these discussions have actually happened over the last two days here in the digital and some of the accelerators we had here, but how do we measure uh, true accountability um, and, and in a way that it leads us to better delivery and acceleration in the way we work with partners? Thank you. Could I come back to, to the two ministers uh, picking up uh, Jeremy's point? Some tough decisions have to be made. Priorities need to be set. Uh, already it was tough enough, I think, within the action plan to have you know those seven accelerators. And there were a lot who, uh, some that were kicked out, others that wanted to be added on, etc., etc. So uh, if I, I could ask uh, first Magda and then Ruth to say something about this priority setting. Do you see your priorities reflected in the accelerators? Or do you think at country level one might still be deciding what exactly needs to be accelerated? No, I definitely uh, connect with the um, uh, seven accelerators. There is the issue of data. 
and um, digital health, which I think is very, very close to uh, the needs we have. Uh, the innovative programming for fragile and vulnerable countries is again another sustainable financing. I think um, most countries will find um, um, uh, their niche uh, within the seven uh, accelerators. We we don't need to uh, to redefine those. What we need is to um, identify how um, the uh, agencies will work together around um, the four. Uh, engage, accelerate um, uh, the four uh, elements to uh, get the countries going and going quickly. Uh, so that's, um, because like I said, um, 10 years is such a short time. Uh, we don't have much time left and we need to get going and start working harder uh, to achieve the objectives and goals. Thank you, Ruth. Now, the beautiful thing is that uh, in 2015-16, Uganda was able to align her strategic plan to the Sustainable Development Goals. And the seven accelerators actually speak to what we've been discussing even in this uh, summit, universal health coverage. And that is what we are all focusing to. And so when we talk about prioritizing, Obviously, we can't do everything. So there are certain critical things that need to be picked, prioritized, and worked on, but those should be the things that have impact on the ground. And when you look at the seven accelerators, primary health care is a perfect tool for universal health coverage. And we all know that. And so coming together to address that aspect is a, a good game changer. Addressing the issue of sustainable financing for health, speaking to the countries about national health insurance schemes and ending catastrophic expenditures by countries themselves investing is a good game changer. Addressing the issues of communities and civil society engagement, extremely important. I think the, the last two days I've spent here, I've been talking about communities, communities, and communities. Because once we get communities on our side, and they understand perfectly why we do certain interventions on them, and they understand the value and the benefit, then they will come to our side. Speaking about reducing new rates of infections in adolescents and young girls, they need to know why. They need to know why we are discussing them. Severally, they've said nothing for us without us. We need to get them in there to participate, to understand, to appreciate, and then the interventions will work. The determinants of health cannot be addressed without a multi-sectoral approach. And that is why many of the plans on universal health coverage need to take a multi-sectoral approach. Within the countries, of course with support of the 12 agencies, if we clearly identify the indicators that speak to health from all the other MDAs, track them, at the end of the day have accountability, then we'll get there. And lastly, the issue of data and data in real time. Data in real time is extremely important. That is what helps with the outbreaks. That is what helps with the decisions. Gavi just supported me to run a very big campaign on measles rubella, and by the way, I scored extremely well. I commented on that, I'm sure. Yes. The reason why is because I engaged with the communities. And that is why they turned up in millions. Our target was 18.1. We are approaching 19 million. Vaccination is still ongoing because two things, we engaged with the communities and we had data in real time, you know, being transmitted and observed on a dashboard. And so I, I agree. First of all, the seven accelerators are extremely important, but prioritizing things is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Peter, I'd just like to get back to you on this issue of data in real time. It was something that really impressed me. I think it was even last year here at the World Health Summit when you said, you know, as a banker, <laughs> I got information like this and then I go into the health sector and the data I have to work with are three years old or sometimes older. So uh, can you also uh, comment on that accelerator in particular and how one can move that forward and where you think that can be improved most rapidly? A year later, I am still feeling the same. <laughs> um, no, this is, a this is a huge challenge we face um, in uh, global health, is that the cycle time of getting high quality disaggregated data in a way that can inform decision making is too slow. Um, and um, you can't sort of wave a wand and fix it because it goes right down to the level of the data collection system that a community health worker is using, the way that is aggregated, the way that it's analyzed and interpreted. Um, but we are, we are definitely stepping up our investment, as is Gavi, as are others, in how we can support countries in building systems for data that are faster, more responsive, more usable as decision-making tools. Um, do I think we're spending enough on it? No, I don't think we're spending enough on it. Um, I mean, the reality is um, a single large global bank is probably spending more on data than, than the entire multilateral system um, in the health arena. Um, uh, and it just gives you a sense of the relative scale of investment. Um, can, I, can I just pick up, we're, we're, we're running the risk, this panel, of being almost too kind of agreeable um, with each other. We're, we're, all, we're, we're, we're all sort of say very sort of, and, 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 I, and I think one of the things about the Global Action Plan is, and I want to pick up on your point about having sort of robust, uncomfortable um, discussions. I think one of the things that would be a real improvement is actually if we can have more robust, uncomfortable discussions about difficult trade-offs and also the ways we go about things. I mean, one of the things I've been reflecting on about the accelerators, and I say this as somebody who was deeply involved in them, so I completely take the blame of it, is they're perfectly sensible categories, but they're not very outcome-focused. Right, if you talk about determinants or data, um, on reflecting on it, I would prefer to have something which actually took elements of the SDG3 targets, some of the sub-targets, and then said, how are we going to accelerate? How are we collectively going to accelerate? And because you actually need elements of each of these things. You need better data. You, if, you, if you're going to take, say, the target on neglected tropical diseases, you need better data. You need community involvement. You need more R&D. You need actually to cut across um, the different um, component parts. And so one of the things I think we have to think about, because I don't think the Global Action Plan should be a static thing. I mean, I know we printed it and all that, um, but, but we, should be we should be challenging ourselves on how to make it more effective, more of a driver of change. And I think thinking about how we can use these accelerators actually in terms of the outcome, actually in terms of the sub-targets of SDG3 and sort of what we can do to make achievement of those faster, more certain, more universal, leaving no one behind, no country behind. I, that, that's something that I think we still got work to do to make that happen. I would agree very much, and I'd actually always understood them to be, you know, in a way, tools, accelerating tools for goals that have already been set. Because particularly in the early uh, discussions, there were some people who were ready to set new goals, and we said, whoops, we've got our goals, you know, we have SDG3, but, you know, what helps us accelerate them? And uh, so I think you're, you're and, and quite I think right. Yeah. If I, just, I think as a first stage, it was yeah. a sensible way to cut Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But it, slightly we've got the problem at the moment is that the R&D people like Jeremy were all talking to each other and having sensible conversations. Yeah, exactly. The health financing people like us and Gavi and World Bank and GFF are talking to each other. The communities and civil... Uh, actually, what we need to do is force some of those conversations across those groups around how we achieve elements yes. of, of the SDG3 target. Yes, Magda. Thanks, quickly. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about data, digital health, and acceleration, 
uh, one group that we need to bring on board on these discussions is uh, education, academia. We urgently need new skills to be able to transform the way we do uh, progress on health uh, outcomes in the countries. I think uh, as we get more sophisticated uh, or simpler but digital uh, tools for uh, doing health stuff, uh, we need to think about the health workers and the, 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 the new set of skills that we need and uh, quickly work on those. So academia, education needs to come on board. Just um, to give an example of how disconnected the, um, uh, the work of the agencies are. Um, three weeks in a row, I had um, Global Fund, UNAIDS, Gavi, uh, and another agency coming one after the other. Uh, my colleague from the Ministry of uh, Economy and Finance had the IMF, uh, the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is no connector. Of course, the government is supposed to be connecting those dots, but somehow, globally, there has to be a mechanism for uh, them to find a way of uh, either coming together or um, discussing uh, before going how they would connect the dots between uh, discussions on fiscal policy with the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the challenges they have in the health sector. Just to say countries left behind feel that we desperately need this. Thank you. I would like to bring an additional voice into the conversation. I understand what representative of one of the other partners is also here from UNFPA. Yes. Uh, would you give us your reflections on this discussion? Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, first of all, let me add my voice about the importance of um, partnership. Um, for United Nations, it's not a choice now uh, to come together and work, particularly at the country level. It has become an obligation because the member states want us to work together to deliver the sustainable development goals. This partnership is not only among UN agencies, but also with other partners, primarily government, private sector, civil society, and other you know, groups need to come work together. And the, there are mechanisms in place. Um, the common country assessment, which actually shows scenarios and the needs, and uh, cooperation uh, framework, uh, which is being rolled out, how, how to plan and implement and monitor you know, progress. And the third is leadership, uh, bringing a full-time a resident coordinator of United Nations that brings all stakeholders in a given country uh, to lead you know, uh, the implementation of SDGs. But to, um, because UNFPA together with WHO leads one of the accelerators on data uh, and digital health. And there are three reasons that prompted you know, the 12 organization to choose this. One is um, to ensure um, achieving SDG three and it's population coverage. When we talk of communities, people, we aggregate. There are so many um, you know, um, uh, needs within the population, from newborn to uh, a child to um, an adolescent and um, the older people. And there are also um, groups who are historically neglected behind, and the data need to capture that. The other is services. There are so many services that are needed among uh, the populations, and that need to be also captured uh, in a, a better way. The third is uh, geography. When we talk of geography, not only continent, country, or subnational, but also importantly, uh, people who are living in fragile and humanitarian contexts need to be captured to ensure that no one is left behind. Now, the other is the challenge of data. There are two you know, sides to this. One is, um, one is you know, the accurate and incomplete data, and the other is the side of um, um, the um, use and application of the data, and the capacity lacks in there and need to be overcome. The 12 organizations have come up with a plan, and the plan has a chapter within you know, um, one chapter on data, and this is to basically outline how to um, get real-time disaggregated and, and, and secure data. 
And this data needs to be available, not only people who are at a micro level, but people who are also in the front line who are you know, providing the services. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we're at a point where we want to do a last round, and I'd like to start the last round with Jeremy and uh, really pick up the issues. And I'd like to take up this point uh, Magda said earlier. There, there are difficult issues involved here. There are issues, you know, which will also lead to conflict. There are issues where one needs great levels of openness, but still, you know, a feeling about a, a joint purpose. And it's quite clear if we don't resolve those, let me call them wicked problems, then we're not going to be able to achieve the SDGs and the action plan. So could I ask each of you to sort of indicate where you think such an area might be, how one has to be conscious about it, because only if we're conscious about it can we address them. And I think with that, we would also set a bit of an agenda for where we'd like to pick up again next year here when we discuss moving forward with the action plan. So, you know, put up your most critical hat, not in the sense of, you know, oh, you know, we lose all our optimism, we, uh, we want to, you know, just be critical, but, but to say, unless, you know, we are willing to address this after 30, 40 years of global health, uh, we will not move forward. Jeremy, would you start? You're usually a person that does that very well. Okay, so don't judge on that. Um, so, so two areas. Um, one is who is the audience. Um, the 12 agencies have come together, but if the 12 agencies come together as a club and don't make sure that they communicate, communicate, communicate until they're sick of it and be inclusive, it'll fail. That's number one. And the second is I'm not comfortable that we've got the right balance between this, the, the, what we've had, which is a series of vertical structures, and then now a talk of totally horizontal. We must not lose the impact that the vertical structures have bought whilst we bring in a more horizontal approach. And there is a risk that we switch from one to the other. We lose the benefits of one as we bring in the second. And somehow we've got to find a better intellectual and practical underpinning of combining vertical and horizontal programs. Thank you. Seth? So no, just one. So I, I would add two, and I started to talk about one of them, and that really is the last mile first and the importance of that. Um, it's more expensive. It's harder to do. There is a reason that people are being missed. More and more, it's displaced people and refugees. It's people living in, in uh, urban slums. And of course, um, we're going to see um, with climate change and other activities more of that. So making sure that we don't forget those. The other area, and this is you know, a complicated one is around universal, universal health coverage. Because for the poorest countries, you know, making sure that the investments are um, with the most allocative efficiency is going to be critical. The danger we have, and, and the minister already talked about it, is countries want to set up insurance schemes to deal with not having people tip into poverty. The reason they're tipping into poverty is because of hospitalization, is because of secondary and tertiary care, and what you can do is shift money from primary care, which can cover 90% of the health needs of country, and you can shift it in an allocative inefficiency way into providing support so you have universal health coverage, but actually makes health worse in the population. So how we have those really honest conversations and deal with making sure if we do things that it is adequately financed and we don't rob Peter to pay Paul is going to be, I think, one of the tough challenges in this movement. Thank you. Peter? There's a bunch of health issues which are caused not by lack of money or lack of drugs or science, but they're caused by a tolerance of stigma, marginalization, criminalization of communities, or of levels of gender-based violence, that unless we have uncomfortable discussions and governments are prepared to do politically tough things about changing norms in their societies, 
we won't solve the health problems. You can't solve them by purely biomedical um, means. Um, if you have sex workers discriminated against or criminalized, or men who have sex with men, or transgender, or people who inject drugs, or refugees, or if you allow and don't cr take decisive action against high levels of gender-based violence, we're not going to deal with some of the, the underlying health issues that those cause. <laughs> Sorry, I had one other point. Um, I think we should have an even greater sense of urgency about this. The thing that I found a bit shocking coming into this world is how many people are still dying of things that we have good cures for and don't cost that much. And that's true in AIDS, TB, and malaria, but it's true in a number of other areas as well. And, and this is both a challenge to the governments in the countries, but it's a challenge to the rest of us as well, that we kind of tolerate that. And, and I think the Global Action Plan is part of the answer, but the, generally speaking, we should just act faster and act with a greater sense of urgency. Thank you, Peter. Could we hear from the two ministers, Magda? Anything you'd like to add in terms of the difficult, tangible, wicked problem challenge you feel we must address? I think the most difficult thing for every one of us is change. Uh, and uh, if we are ready to change, then we'll be able to implement this uh, Global Action Plan. If we want to remain in our comfort zones and uh, um, see countries as one size fit all, fits all, it will be difficult. We Thank should you. be prepared to change. Thank you, Ruth. One critical thing is that <coughs> Countries are at different levels in their health system. And it is not easy to move countries at the same pace. Countries will have to move at their own pace. But what is important is support to strengthen the systems moving forward. So that at the end of 10 years, things have changed and the change is palpable. Obviously, it will take a lot of mindset change even within the countries. It will take a lot of flexibility and it will take a lot of communication. It is possible and I do know that it will work out. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Last words, Bernhard. Yeah, while listening to the others, I had like a number of things I would like to say, but it's not the time anymore. So I pick one which you probably won't expect. And, uh, but it's very critical for us because we're all um, organizations that have a long history, which has incredible strength. Um, but one thing that we are not very good at is, you know, when we, always, when we think about should we do something, we always think about what's the risk of doing it we very rarely turn this upside down and say, what's the risk of not doing it? And what's the risk of not doing it has to start absolutely with reaching better health for people, reaching the triple billions, and work back from that. If I don't do something, will I be equally capable of achieving better health? And ask this every time we, we, we take these decisions. I think that's, that's really would make a big difference for us. Thank you. So I would like to pick up from Peter and uh, I would like uh, to end this panel with a plea to you, with the plea to really develop, keep and strengthen that sense of urgency. You have heard from the Director General that if we don't accelerate, if we don't 
push that feeling of urgency, we will not achieve the SDGs in health. Actually, in a whole number of areas, and again, the example of girls and young women infected by HIV AIDS, areas will get worse. We've mentioned, you know, the fragile regions and environments, and if we don't, are not able to address them, things will get worse. So while you know, we all believe in this wonderful message that the book Factfulness gives us, that we've made tremendous strides, we cannot rest. And I would really hope you leave this room with this sense of urgency that we have heard, that uh, we keep up this sense of urgency also here at the World Health Summit, we will take it as a challenge and that each time we come together, we instill in each other that sense of urgency. So I would like you to thank this panel, but I would also like you to clap very loud for the whole team of the World Health Summit that has allowed us to come together in this way and have these conversations. All right, thank you very much. What a kiss. So, thank you very much. Have a wonderful trip home and see many of you, maybe all of you, next year. Thank you. <laughs>